Hello, today I'll be talking about preventing and reducing vertebrate pest damage to fruits and vegetable crops. The damage caused to crops by birds and mammals can lead to reduced yields and reduction of crop quality. So this presentation will present options, management options, and strategies to reduce this type of damage. Learning objectives for this session are to understand wildlife nuisance management options, understanding legal implications of management, learning some characteristics of common mammal species which can cause damage, and understanding the concept of integrate, integrated pest management as it relates to nuisance wildlife management. Crops should be scouted for damage just as you would scout for insects, weeds, and disease. It can be challenging to identify what animal is causing the damage because the animal has often damaged the crop and left the area. Many species, species such as raccoon are nocturnal or active in night causing damage when we're not out in the field. Therefore, you're going to have to closely examine the crop looking for damage. If damage is being caused year-round, the cost of control may be warranted. Seasonal damage may stop on its own as wildlife move to other crops uh, or, or foods in the area. Seasonal damage can be anticipated from year to year and management strategies should be put in place prior to the occurrence of seasonal damage. For example, raccoon or deer damage to sweet corn. Control techniques are limited to behavior management with a few exceptions. So let's take a look at options available to you. Strategies to manage wildlife damage fall into five categories. Population reduction, modification of the habitat, exclusion, repellents, and frightening devices. Toxicants are also available for some species, but primarily rodents. The rod rodenticide has to be labeled for that particular species and are not generally available for larger mammalian vertebrates. Avicides are also available to manage a limited number of bird species that I'll talk about later in this presentation. Keep in mind that one, any one strategy is likely not to solve your problem. You'll need to approach vertebrate press management through an integrated approach as we do with insects, diseases, and weeds. Let's take a look at population reduction as our first management strategy. Wildlife are protected by state and federal laws. Therefore, the first step in using this strategy is to obtain a wildlife nuisance permit. These permits are available through your local wildlife biologist with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Wildlife biologists cover multiple counties, so to find the biologist responsible for your county, use the University of Illinois Extension's Living with Wildlife in Illinois website. On this website, you'll be able to search for a professional biologist by a particular county. These permits are free of charge and must be obtained even if you want to live trap an animal and move it off your farm unharmed. If you'd rather hire someone to assist you with this trapping and removal of animals, a list of licensed wildlife nuisance trappers can also be found at the previously mentioned website. Many people think that because the animal is causing damage on private property, they don't need a permit. But this is not the case. So obtain a permit to trap and remove wildlife from your farm. Currently, you don't need a nuisance wildlife permit to reduce populations of small rodents such as mice, voles, 13 line ground squirrels, moles, and chipmunks on your property. Population management can also be done through the Illinois hunting or trapping season established each year by the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Of course, this kind of seasonal hunting or trapping can only be done on rural or other property which is not subject to local ordinances which restrict this type of activity. The use of a toxicant is not a management option except for small rodents. The picture on the bottom left hand corner of this slide is the application of a toxicant for pocket gophers in the plain states. Remember when we're using a toxicant it has to be labeled for that particular species, primarily rodents. Population reduction through the live capture and release of animals has some limitations but may be the only solution for problem animals defined as those that are denned under or living inside a house or outbuilding. Otherwise, the removal of a few animals from your farm is considered to be a short-term fix to the problem because of immigration of other animals of the same species from adjacent habitat. The wildlife management concept called carrying capacity may help you understand this movement of animals looking for food, water, water and shelter components of habitat. 
carrying capacity is defined as the number of animals of a particular species that can be supported by available habitat. So when animals are removed from an area, it makes available resources that can support additional animals and immigration occurs and the void is quickly filled. Another problem with trapping and moving wildlife to a new home is the release of that animal into habitat that may already be at carrying capacity and competition and probably death may occur. In addition, it's illegal to release the animal on public property. The animal must be released on private property with permission of the landowner. Your permit for wildlife nuisance trapping will indicate the, how that animal can be released or if it can be released. Trapping and removing animals can be very time consuming and it also can be quite expensive, especially if you hire a nuisance wildlife trapper licensed by the state of Illinois. You may expect to pay $50 to $100 per animal removed. Many of the wildlife species that cause conflicts for fruit and vegetable growers are game species in Illinois. One strategy to reduce the population of wildlife on your farm is to harvest animals during the hunting and trapping season. If your family doesn't participate in these activities, you may consider offering this opportunity to friends or others in your community. Hunting and trapping can reduce the population to levels more sustainable to their food resource, natural food resources, which may help reduce damage to your crop. Hunting also changes the behavior of wildlife by causing animals to avoid portions of your farm. So it's a great tool that can be incorporated into your integrated pest management program. Reducing the available habitat for particular species is, is the second management tool. Unfortunately, as a vegetable or fruit grower, you are increasing the available food resources within the home range of both herbivores and omnivores. However, by knowing the habitat needs of a particular species of wildlife, you may, able, may be able to reduce another component of their habitat. For example, rabbits may be attracted to vegetable crop fields, but without adequate escape cover, such as rows of shrubs or tall grass areas, rabbits may seek higher quality habitat with both food and escape cover available. By removing brush piles, tall grass areas, or other permanently vegetated areas, adjacent to crop fields, crop damage may be reduced. Exclusion is a very, can be a very effective tool to reduce wildlife damage to crops, but it is an expensive option and therefore has to be considered a long-term investment. In most cases, fencing is used to keep wildlife out of a crop area, but sometimes it's used to individually protect trees. The upper right picture in this slide shows chicken wire used to protect trees from beaver damage. The lower picture shows mesh netting used as a barrier for white-tailed deer. Although repellents have some limitations, their effectiveness can be increased when used in conjunction with other nuisance wildlife management strategies. Repellents are regulated as a pesticide, so it's important to read and follow the label carefully as we do with all pesticides. There are three types of repellents based on how they work to repel wildlife. Taste repellents are used on primarily on ornamental plantings and fruit trees during the dormant season to reduce damage. Area repellents are used to create a barrier around the crop field or sometimes within the crop field. The third group or type of repellent is the tactile group. This is primarily used to reduce bird roosting in outbuildings. The sticky tactile type of repellent used on the beams or rafters of buildings. Although repellents have limitations, they still, still can be an effective tool. Remember that most, cannot be applied, most repellents can't be applied to vegetable crops and they must also be reapplied after heavy rains. Remember to read and check the label. The overall effectiveness of a repellent can also be influenced by external factors such as the availability of alternative untreated food sources to wildlife and the density of the local wildlife population. Repellents in, have been shown to be effective in research trials at rates of about anywhere from 55 to 85 percent. 
Therefore, you should consider these techniques as a tool that might be used to reduce the damage or a technique to be used in combination with other integrated pest management strategies. Because repellents are more effective for short periods of time, they can be used to reduce damage when yields can be impacted during a specific time period. For example, when deer can impact sweet corn yields through silk clipping during pollination. So area repellents can be used in conjunction with other techniques such as electric fencing to keep deer out of, out of cornfields until pollination has occurred. In general, frightening devices and techniques have been shown to be ineffective or have had limited effectiveness when used alone. Visual frightening devices such as balloons, plastic snakes, and similar devices have little effect because wildlife quickly learn that there's no real threat to their safety. Visual devices that offer movement, such as strips of mylar ribbon hanging above the crop, and, or those visual f devices that are moved frequently, can have better results but are still considered short-term remedies. Sound producing devices such as the propane fired cannon pictured at the bottom right hand corner of this slide are also evaluated as short term techniques because the animals still get accustomed to the sound and see it as no, actual, no real threat to their safety. Their effectiveness however can be increased when moved to different parts of the field and fired on a variable pattern using a timer. These techniques are most useful when attempting again to keep damage from occurring during short periods of time, similar to repellents used in sweet corn fields. We've taken a look at some management strategies in general. Let's turn uh, our attention to looking at some common animals that can impact vegetable and fruit production. Eastern cottontail rabbits can cause damage to both vegetables as they're getting established as well and to woody plantings in our orchard during the winter months. Because rabbit's home range is small, about 10 acres, a locally large, large population of rabbits can cause extensive damage. They have a high reproductive rate, but being at the bottom of the food chain, their average lifespan is only about a year. Exclusion is a technique that can be effective for reducing damage from rabbits. However, it can be an expensive option when protecting large crop areas. Remember that fencing to exclude rabbits must have openings of, of one inch in diameter or smaller and be at least two feet tall and installed. That fence needs to be installed tight to the ground or buried two to three inches in the ground. When fencing is used to protect woody plants during the winter, Drifting snow can make the fence ineffective as shown in the picture in the upper left hand corner of this slide. Young thin bark trees in, in an orchard can be protected during the winter with a cylinder of hardware cloth. The hardware cloth pictured in the upper right hand corner of this slide. Make sure the openings of the hardware cloth are a quarter inch in diameter or smaller and that cylinder will also help reduce vole damage in the winter. Remember that that cylinder needs to be tight to the ground and stand two to three inches away from the trunk of the tree to prevent feeding through the wire mesh cylinder. There are several taste repellents that are labeled for use on woody plants and ornamentals for rabbits, but none of those can be used on vegetable crops. Many of these repellents have as the active ingredient theorem, which is a fungicide. And remember to read and follow the labeled instructions on all repellents when attempting to reduce damage from rabbits or any other species. Also remember that some repellents may be re must be reapplied frequently, such as after heavy rainfall. So check the label. Because rabbits have a small home range, Habitat modification can reduce damage by keeping escape cover and preferred habitat away from crop fields and orchards. Rabbits prefer tall grass, shrubs, and brushy areas because these areas offer protection from predation. 
Mowing vegetation surrounding the crop field and within orchards can reduce these preferred escape cover areas. When you're pruning your fruit trees, don't leave piles of branches within the orchard and pick up dropped fruit to reduce food supplies within the orchard. Habitat modification as a technique may not eliminate the damage, but it can help make other combined techniques in your integrated pest management program for wildlife more effective. Statewide, the rabbit population decreased slightly in 2013, following a little bit of a downward trend statewide over the past several years. But the population is increasing slightly in northern and southern Illinois. Rabbit populations can also increase or decrease dramatically in local areas because of that small home range that we mentioned earlier. If rabbits are to be removed from an area through trapping, Remember, a nuisance wildlife permit is going to be required. Reduction of urban populations through nuisance trapping can be an effective tool in reducing local populations during the winter. However, trapping and hunting of rabbits may not reduce the population for the following cropping season because individuals are going to move into the available habitat, like we talked about earlier in the concept of carrying capacity. In areas where firearms can be discharged, rabbits may be hunted in season with a valid hunt Illinois hunting license. Let's talk about deer for a minute. White-tailed deer can, can impact, again, both fruit and vegetable yields from browsing as well as from antler rubbing in the fall or winter. Their home range is much larger than rabbits, so managing their behavior is a little more challenging because the animals may spend time on adjacent lands to your farm. Deer are another important game species in Illinois, with multiple hunting seasons available to licensed hunters each year in Illinois. The fawns are going to stay with the doe for almost a year, so as does herd up with each other later in the winter, they create large groups of animals that may visit your orchard as part of their home range and cause potential extensive damage to your orchard during the winter time. Deer don't have upper incisors so their browsing damage appears as torn branch or leaf edges rather than a clean cut like rabbit damage. Antler, antler rubbing occurs beginning in September through the fall and early winter. This damage appears as shredded or torn bark and often broken branches as in the picture in the bottom left. Deer sometimes also damage watermelon, cantaloupe, and pumpkin crops with their hooves as they break open fruit to consume the more palatable inner portions of the fruit. This damage can of course be identified by the scrape marks on the fruit left by the two toes of their hooves. Antler rubbing can be a, an extensive problem in, in orchards as we're trying to get trees established. This rubbing can remove bark and cambium on thin bark trees causing the death of the tree through girdling. Therefore young trees and thin bark trees should be protected within the home range of deer with either individual protection or an area fence. Make sure the protection is in place by early fall, probably September 1 is a good target date. There are, no, <coughs> there are and there are several commercial tree protectors available, trade names such as Vexar and Tubex. Make sure that when you're using a plastic tube or a homemade wire cylinder around the tree trunk, remember to install these cylinders tight to the ground to reduce the risk of voles getting inside the protector that will in turn eat the inner bark of the tree and girdle it causing similar damage as antler rubbing. In this picture the tree was this particular tree was protected using wooden lath material taking three lath and wrapping duct tape to hold it in place. This type of protection doesn't allow uh, any kind of protected area for voles to get inside uh, and consume that inner bark anyway. When individual tree protection is not not practical for you, fencing the deer from the orchard or the crop fields is another option. 
fencing, remember, is an investment that will have to be recouped over the lifetime of the fence. The fence in this slide is a design that can, can be effective for smaller fields and when deer populations are low. One strand of electric fence is used with an aluminum foil covered with peanut butter. These tabs are attached or taped to the fence. And then the deer smell the peanut butter, touch the electric, electrified tabs, scaring the animal, and therefore you're really training the deer to stay out of the field. This design is also used sometimes as a temporary fence design to keep deer out of sweet corn fields during pollination or melons during harvest. Remember that the electric fence charger should be one that's designed to deliver a higher electrical charge uh, specifically designed for wildlife populations. In the case of deer, they have smaller points of contact with the ground than domestic live livestock. So if you're going to use electric chargers to, uh, to exclude wildlife, make sure again that they are designed for wildlife, specifically deer. With a one strand fence design, visibility to the deer can be an issue. If they run into the fence, that one strand is likely to be knocked down or broken and the system obviously compromised. Polytape type electrical fencing material like in the picture can be used to increase the visibility. There should also be a, should also be a clear area outside the fence so that deer have a chance to take a look at and see that obstruction. This area should be at least 6 to 12 feet in width. This particular design and all electric fence designs should be electrified immediately after construction because remember it's a behavior modification fence not a true physical barrier. So the first time that animal comes in contact with it it needs to be startled or scared and trained not to, not to uh, enter into the crop field. There are several fence designs for deer available for uh, your viewing and research on the University of Illinois Extension Living with Wildlife in Illinois website or Living with White-tailed Deer in Illinois website, both on our Extension main access to our Extension main uh, website. Regardless of the design, electric fence design, Remember that these electric fences need to be charged with a unit that's designed for wildlife, should be electrified after construction, even when fences are partially completed. The design at the bottom of this slide has been used at the Biltmore Estate in North Carolina to reduce damage. And in visiting that area several years ago, uh, the, the uh, groundskeepers were indicating that deer coming in contact with an unelectrified fence um, when they're putting up miles of this fence, we're, we did go ahead and continue to go through that fence. You can see that it's only 43 inches tall. They're going to step through that fence. They continue to do that, um, so they weren't trained to uh, recognize that as um, as potentially harmful. So make sure you electrify that fence, even though it's not completely installed. This offset electric fence design is used to protect the crop area to the left of the slide. Deer approach the fence from the right and even at six feet tall this uh, obstacle could be jumped pretty easily by deer. However in most cases deer are going to try to go through or under an obstacle before they try to jump over it. It's less less risky for the deer. So the wires, all these wires are electrified as they're trying to step on through that they're going to hit those and realize that um, it's it's there's some something that they can't quite figure out and going to probably avoid that area. Another picture of that slide that offset design you can see there's a clear area outside the fence again the deer coming in this case from the left side crop area is on the right side um, but that clear area clear area outside the fence again is um, going to increase the visibility to the deer and reduce the risk of the deer running into that fence and knocking it down. A relatively new fencing material is this mesh netting material as you can see in this slide. Yeah, it's a true barrier design 
so there's not it's not electrified um, and if you're going to use a true barrier whether it's mesh or wire the fence needs to be at a height of a minimum of eight feet you can see in this picture that the visibility might be an issue so that the producer has attached white flagging to increase the visibility for this particular fence design again remember that uh, you're going to benefit from uh, a, a clear area on the outside of the fence so the deer can see you see that barrier ahead taste repellents work um, similar to a contact type of pesticide so when we're applying them to keep deer from uh, consuming uh, ornamental plants uh, it, they're best used during the dormant season when the plants are not um, not growing otherwise we need to increase the uh, application schedule so we're protecting that new growth uh, as those shoots elongate remember that taste repellent use is limited to woody ornamentals and fruit trees without fruit uh, if if the product you choose doesn't have an anti-transparent already in the mixture um, you one should be you know incorporated in that tank mix something like vapor guard uh, research results and cost comparisons for various types of deer repellents probably more research done in this area uh, can be found uh, on our living with wildlife website I'll link to that that research North Carolina State is doing quite a bit and continues to do quite a bit of deer uh, taste repellent research. Area repellents work again by causing the deer to be afraid of the area. They can't figure out that smell. Edible animal protein, you can see at the second one in that slide, uh, is the active ingredient in a product called Plant Skid. It had uh, pretty good results. Uh, for protection of woody plantings over the winter time. Ammonium soaps of fatty acids uh, have had fair to good results in reducing damage from browsing. Uh, these ammonium soaps of fatty acids uh, are sold as the active ingredient in a product called Hinder. And Hinder is actually the only repellent uh, of either type that's labeled for use in a limited number of vegetable crops. So they're uh, remember that when we're applying a pesticide it has to be labeled for both that species but also the area that we're applying it in so hinder is one of the few that we have in our toolbox for vegetable crop um, protection and it's it's uh, put on the outside of that sweet corn field uh, there has been some research that's shown hinder is only effective for two to three weeks so that, that still may be a tool that uh, you can use to keep the deer out of the cornfield during that critical pollination period when they might be uh, doing uh, silk clipping, eating those silks off the uh, ears of corn. As previously, previously mentioned, repellents are better suited for dormant tree protection uh, from browsing. Research trials have demonstrated that at best the browsing damage is reduced, not eliminated. So again, your expectation that uh, you know, you're going to eliminate all damage probably not realistic so uh, repellents are used to reduce the damage um, we may need to add another technique in that integrated plan to help uh, increase the uh, effectiveness remember that with all repellents uh, the effectiveness may be reduced if there's a high population of deer on the farm the deer don't have an untreated food supply there's, they may ignore the, the taste repellent as well um, in addition, there are some individuals that will ignore the repellent even when other food is abundant. So just like humans evidently uh, have strange tastes for, for food items, uh, deer or you might find individual deer that ignore that taste repellent while, while most of the population uh, stays away from it. Deer are really an important game species in Illinois. There are a number of uh, hunting seasons available to reduce the population uh, each year through recreational hunting. Um, hunting activities uh, on, your, on your farm can help 
not only reduce the population, but they're going to affect the deer's behavior. Uh, they're going to so that they're going to disperse out off your farm onto adjacent property. They know that there's some kind of danger on your farm when you've got hunting activities going on. Remember that the home range for deer is one to three square miles in size. So deer are going to be moving across your property unless you unless your farm is uh, of that size. If population reduction is a management goal, remember that the removal of does and the cooperation with adjacent landowners it's going to help accomplish that goal. Nuisance wildlife permits, uh, if you're going to try to reduce the population of, of white-tailed deer during the non-hunting season, um, is a little bit different compared to all other species. If you're interested in obtaining a deer removal permit, then the Illinois Department of Natural Resources wildlife biologist is going to come to your farm and calculate an estimated uh, yield loss prior to making that uh, issuance of that permit. So you've got to prove yield loss uh, and a certain percentage of loss before that permit's issued. Habitat, mod habitat vegetation management is a relatively new concept. There's some research going on in this area. Um, some practices that are being used include you know, leaving open vegetated areas between crop fields and wooden edges, um, as well as planting food plots. So providing them an alternative food source so perhaps the, the taste repellent is going to work a little more effectively. In the winter months when food supplies are covered with snow, uh, alternative woody browse and adjacent woodlands can take pressure off fruit trees and orchards. So if you've got some wooded acreage, timber harvesting techniques with, that encourage uh, reproductive growth such as group selection harvesting or small partial clear cutting um, might be incorporated, in, incorporated into your whole farm management plan uh, when possible and it's going to take some pressure off of that uh, again the, the browse of the of the trees in your orchard they've got an alternative food source Okay, let's shift the, uh, gears again and talk about voles. Voles are uh, also, uh, or at least used to be called meadow mice or field mice. They have a shorter tail, stockier body than house mice. And there are three species of voles that can be found in Illinois. The meadow vole, prairie vole, and the woodland or pine vole. Uh, both common names for the same species, woodland and pine. They're tall grass habitat animals that use surface runways but also underground tunnels and burrows. Annual crops um, are usually at lower risk of damage than perennial crops such as orchards because uh, the, we'd have less vegetated cover in, in an annual crop field. Bulls are active all day long both day and night uh, and they will produce year-round, reproduce year-round so um, you know, po sometimes populations can re reach very high numbers uh, a, and the population tends to be cyclic just like all wildlife. In this slide you can see the damage to a seedling tree caused by voles eating the bark up in the left hand corner, a green bean damage and surface runway grass clipping habits on the two pictures on the right. Uh, the bottom left hand picture is that same grass clipping uh, that occurred in a yard underneath the snow. Again, voles are at the bottom of the food chain. They're looking for uh, you know, some kind of type of overhead cover to reduce the risk of predation. Uh, the teeth marks when you're identifying damage from voles compared to rabbits. Uh, the teeth are smaller. They're going to be closer together. Those bite marks on the, on the plant. Um, voles are also going to eat plant parts both above and below the ground so they especially love sweet potatoes so um, managing the vines on your sweet potatoes getting those vines up off the ground to reduce that protective cover uh, is a uh, integrated pest management strategy that if you're growing, growing sweet potatoes um, might be incorporated for bowl management Prairie and, uh, and meadow voles and pine voles, again, are the three species that we have in Illinois. Um, 
and that while they look similar <coughs> um, it's important to know which kind of bowl you're, you're dealing with at least um, between a pine bowl or a prairie and or meadow bowl. Um, the importance is related to the rodenticide that you're going to use to control uh, those two groups of bowls. Pine bowl damage is often hidden in an orchard because the pine bowls tend to stay and utilize underground or uh, burrowing, burrowing systems and uh, so they're going to girdle that tree by eating the cambium off the bark of the root system and um, and then all of a sudden the tree dies and and uh, um, it's from pine bowl damage so really when you look at those characteristics on this slide for id um, probably the easiest way to identify or distinguish between the two groups of species is with an animal in hand so some snap traps to identify what you've got might be one of the first steps in determining how to develop a, a, a management plan. Another step is uh, to do some monitoring and for how you know how many animals do you have in your uh, on the farm and in, in that crop field. One way to monitor or scout for voles is to use what's been called the apple sign test. Half of a shingle can be cut and used to make a monitoring station placing it on the ground, arched up a little bit. 30 stations are placed per acre as described on this slide. The stations are, are then left unbaited for five days. Uh, after that then a small piece of apple is placed under each sh shingle and then 24 hours later they're going to go back and look for bite marks on that apple slice under those 30 uh, shingles per acre. I'm going to count and then calculate a percent of the apple slices with chewing evidence and that's going to give you an estimate of the potential damage from bowls in that in your orchard. Probably should conduct this test at least once in the fall and again in the spring. It also ought to be ought to be done <clears throat> Uh, 21 days to 30 days <clears throat> after the application of a, of a rodenticide uh, to make sure that, that treatment has worked. Vole, po vole populations can be reduced using a toxicant or, or, or rodenticide. So this is an animal that, you know, we talked about uh, not having a toxicant available for large mammals. This one we do have a couple available. No nuisance permit is required to <clears throat> to use a uh, a toxicant for voles. A rodenticide that has as as the active ingredient zinc phosphide um, is a little more effective than against meadow and prairie voles. While products with the active ingredient chlorofacinone are more effective for pine voles. So again, knowing which species of vole you're dealing with is an important step in the uh, reducing the population through integrated pest management. Well, all rodenticides have some level of toxicity to wildlife. Zinc phosphide has a high toxicity and therefore you need to be take extra care, read and carefully follow the label on zinc phosphide. Probably best uh, applied uh, in, using a bait station. On the label, it will indicate that zinc phosphide can be broadcast applied uh, into vegetated areas, but probably a bait station is a much more uh, a, a much safer uh, application technique to reduce the risk of non-target animal um, mortality. When you're reducing meadow and prairie vole populations, zinc phosphide baiting is probably the best treatment. The voles will learn to avoid zinc phosphide if you leave it in the bait stations year round so you're gonna if the populations are high in the fall as an example you get out you're gonna apply zinc phosphide uh, as a treatment and then switch to a product containing chlorofacinone um, as uh, a, a bait you could leave out during the winter 
uh, because bait shyness is less likely to occur using chlorofacinone rather than zinc phosphide. There are some non-chemical practices or habitat modification that can be used to reduce bowl pressure. Mowing within the orchard throughout the, or throughout the growing season, especially though in the fall, is going to reduce that protective habitat cover that we've talked about being a tall grass habitat animal. You can also remove all vegetation out to the drip line of each fruit, tri fruit tree, um, especially if you've got pine voles uh, in your orchard. Mowing areas adjacent to orchards or to crop, or to crop fields is going to reduce the connected vole habitat, just like we're doing with managing for rabbit populations. Um, predator perches, uh, perches for hawks and owls can be installed as indicated in that last bullet. Um, they're uh, not necessarily going to dramatically decrease the population through uh, predation. Uh, but it's just another practice that if you're trying to uh, maintain um, or reduce the amount of rodenticides you have to apply uh, on your farm. Okay, let's talk about raccoons for a minute. Raccoons are classified as a fur bearer type of species by the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Um, so therefore we have a hunting and trapping season for raccoons in Illinois. They're very adaptable, they live in all types of habitat, they're a habitat generalist, uh, so you're going to find them in urban areas as well as uh, agricultural areas. Raccoons have a very large home range. Uh, males, male raccoons may move in an area that's 3 to 20 square miles in size. The females are going to use an area a little bit smaller, but still 1 to 6 mile, square miles in size. So even bigger, larger home range than than deer. Now that that home range might be reduced if um, locally, if their if food resources are um, adequate. Keep in mind the young stay with the female for the first year, learning how to find food. So in mid to late summer, uh, when our crops are, uh, are are ripening, the raccoon family. Um, female and the young may visit your crop field foraging for food. So all of a sudden you've got three or four or five animals that you're uh, trying to exclude. Exclusion of raccoons from crop fields uh, is probably the best, most effective technique. So uh, we're going to exclude them using electric fencing. Uh, you can use a one wire strand uh, electric fence system where the wire is six inches off the ground or double wire with the second wire being 12 inches off the ground or six inches above that first wire. Make sure the fence charger uh, is put on a timer to turn on at dusk and then off at sunrise. The deer or uh, raccoons are uh, nocturnal but they're also what's called crepuscular in that they're active in those twilight hours of evening and, and, uh, and morning. Make sure that the fencing is installed and charged prior to the anticipated damage. Again, that seasonal damage we talked about several times today, both damage to sweet corn and especially melons. You should also inspect um, buildings frequently. Raccoons will den in buildings and or under buildings. Um, they're great climbers, so inspect buildings for holes or damaged areas and make good uh, timely repairs to reduce the temptation for access by that uh, raccoon. Uh, the picture on this slide shows how electric fencing could be used to prevent access under buildings. So if you can't do it, make a permanent repair to that building, as in the case of this slide, <clears throat> electric fencing can be used. Again, put on a timer. Um, if an individual dens up in a building, it's going to have to be trapped or removed after obtaining uh, a nuisance wildlife permit or by hiring a licensed nuisance trapper. So keep in mind that raccoons in Illinois are going to have to be euthanized or released on your own property. Um, and uh, it, the same would be the for, for skunks that are trapped and uh, they also are required to be euthanized. Both animals are potential 
carriers of rabies as other animals, but um, that requirement um, is going to be listed on your on your permit should you go through the process of getting a wildlife nuisance um, depredation permit from the wildlife. This slide shows some damage from raccoons gaining access to a building. Um, again, it uh, shows that they're very strong animals, uh, very adept at climbing. The bottom center picture shows other utilizing a drain pipe in the, in the corner of that building uh, to gain access to the soffit. So make sure that you're, you know, again, monitoring, don't put off repairing a small hole. Uh, sometimes they'll, you know, create their own opening. Um, but um, even when a, a small hole doesn't exist, but uh, if you can remove the temptation, then it, will, it may help reduce the damage. Other techniques to reduce crop damage from raccoons are, are pretty limited, uh, as there are not any toxicants, repellents, or fumigants that are registered for use on raccoons. Although there are, you know, are a number of home remedies, um, both in terms of um, you know a repellent, uh, there aren't any registered for use. Um, there are also some home remedies for frightening raccoons, um, you know lights and radios, that type of thing, and they have not been shown to be effective for long periods of time. Uh, so the most effective technique to reduce raccoon damage again is uh, exclusion. Groundhogs or woodchucks are uh, an animal that's in the squirrel family. Uh, so they're a big rodent. Um, makes them excellent diggers, but also climbers. So they like open farmland areas that have adjacent wooded habitat. So, you know, our typical small farm and orchard are perfect habitats. Uh, groundhogs have a really small home range of all the animals we've talked about so far. Uh, they have the smallest home area or home range. They will move further than 150 feet when they're moving out, um, dispersing to find their own, the young of the year, uh, to find their own habitat. But in general, they stay pretty close to that den site. They're really good diggers, and they're going to have uh, uh, develop an extensive uh, underground burrowing system that is about 30 feet uh, in length approximately the first year and they'll reuse that the next year uh, and expand that to double that size. They do hibernate um, and um, uh, during the winter time. Groundhogs are game species in Illinois um, therefore you're going to see them listed uh, at a hunting season on our Illinois Department of Natural Resources uh, hunting regulations. Um, so hunting can be used to reduce the population, uh, trapping and, remo and removal, as well as the use of a fumigant gas cartridge. Um, it does require a nuisance wildlife permit uh, during the non-hunting season. Fencing a crop field or orchard is going to require the use of an electric fence uh, alone or in combination with a woven wire fence because of the ability of that animal to climb up and over a uh, you know a standard woven wire fence. If you're going to use a uh, the fumigant or the gas cartridge which is really just a smoke bomb produces carbon monoxide um, th those that technique should never be used in a burrow or den that's under a building uh, because of the potential harm to humans inside uh, or livestock or the as well as the danger of fire. Um, remember that burrow system is quite extensive so um, you know, don't use that fumigant if the burrow is near a building. I've been talking about mammals. Let's talk about birds just for a few minutes to, to close out here this presentation. Uh, damage from birds can occur from their entering, packing, and wash houses, from their feces, and also potentially contaminating. Um, uh, the the uh, foodstuffs of livestock. Uh, all s species of birds are protected by state and federal law, uh, with the exception of these three uh, birds on this slide. Uh, the non-native European starlings, non-native English sparrows, and the pigeon. These three species are going to be the three that are going to enter buildings to nest and feed on grain. 
Um, we're going to see barn swallow is getting, swallows getting into a building. Remember that those, uh, that particular species is protected, uh, protected species, um, but is an insect eater. So these, these three non-native species are going to enter nest in the building, but also eat and contaminate grain. These are the three species that you can uh, utilize uh, an avicide um, to reduce this population. Um, the avicide is applied uh, in a bait station inside the building to protect uh, non-target species. And the avicide also is going to have to be administered by someone with a commercial pesticide applicator license with that um, avicide category on his license. So there are not a lot of these um, commercial applicators available statewide to utilize an avicide. So you may have to contact the Illinois Department of Agriculture to find someone that would be available uh, to administer the avicide. But all of the species are protected by state and federal law. So let's one of the other issues with birds and that being, you know, damage to crops. Um, <clears throat> there are sound producing devices and other frightening devices on the market um, but uh, they're not quite as reliable as exclusion uh, like we're trying as in the case when we're trying to exclude mammals from an area so this slide shows uh, the use of mesh netting that has openings that are smaller than an inch in diameter used being used to exclude birds from the, this grape arbor grape crop um, they can cause some extensive damage on small fruits and tree fruits uh, from their uh, consumption of the of the crop. Make sure that if you're going to go to the expense and time of installation um, of this mesh netting, it's out away from the crop. So it'll have to be a support structure um, underneath the netting. The netting is available in large available in large rolls. So if you're trying to protect a, a, a row of blueberry and blueberry production or um, you know, on grapes in your arbor, um, that system can be set up and it's kind of like a fencing system. It's a long-term investment. Um, so you need to make sure that you're taking care of that netting material to get maximize its uh, life, life expectancy. But uh, uh, exclusion is about, there aren't any repellents or, or uh, uh, that are really available and sound producing devices again just like mammals have a short period of time when they're going to be effective so exclusion is about your best option the yellow-bellied sapsucker uh, you see a picture of that bird on the right there uh, creates its own feeding station on trees uh, pecking roll, rows of holes both horizontal or vertical uh, in the outer bark through the outer bark of the tree to the inner bark. This habit generally doesn't kill a tree that's in good health um, with the damaged areas healing on their own but in some cases where the damage is occurring on a tree within you know over and over and over which that's kind of the concept they create a feeding station and then sometimes they'll come back and enlarge the holes. That picture of that pine tree in the bottom left hand uh, corner of that group of pictures shows the extent of damage that they sometimes can cause and so this that particular pine tree is probably on its way out it, those wounds are not going to have the opportunity to heal up and the tree is probably uh, in the lower uh, canopy anyway not getting enough sunlight and its vigor is is low so but if the trees in good health that tree is going to heal up um, it's generally recommended that uh, you allow that bird to cause damage on one tree in an orchard. Uh, you can cover up that uh, feeding area with mesh uh, material or burlap to get them to move to another tree. Um, but in an orchard system, they just go from one tree to another tree to another tree. So, um, you know, again, you may want to look at um, allowing that bird to use that one tree as its feeding station. They are federally and state protected, so uh, with woodpeckers and, and sap suckers, um, you can discuss the management and or 
permitting to remove those species, bird species of any kind, um, but you'd end up with a state and a federal permit uh, if you're going to trap and remove any birds. Uh, likely you're going to have to try other techniques before you get a nuisance permit for birds. There are, are wildlife nuisance management fact sheets for other species we haven't talked about today as well as the ones we have um, on these websites. The Internet Center for Wildlife Damage Management uh, listed at the bottom is a national extension system resource. Uh, the University of Illinois Living with Wildlife in Illinois, uh, as well as the Living with Wildlife Whitetail Deer in Illinois, our University of Illinois Extension websites, uh, put together in cooperation with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Remember that you can find not only fact sheets about um, the life history and control options for these species we talked about today and others at these three websites, but you can also find uh, your Department of Natural Resources wildlife biologist or a licensed nuisance trapper um, to, for hire at these uh, websites. There are many reasons nuisance control programs fail. Uh, reasons that uh, include those listed on this sli slide. You know, the use of only one management strategy, not enough monitoring for the damage. You got to get out there and do that crop scouting, just like any other uh, insect or weed uh, or uh, disease pest. Animals may uh, have already become accustomed to use, using the area. Uh, more difficult to get out, of, you know, change your behavior once they're, you know, happy with being where they are. No other food resources are available, so they can't move to another area. So it's going to be tougher to get them to move out of your crop field. Um, so you remember to anticipate damage. You had a problem last year, you may have a problem this year, <clears throat> and uh, and or you've got a high population of problem animals. So again, those techniques of population reduction might help. Um, help the overall uh, integrated pest management um, approach be more effective. So remember to use that integrated pest management approach when you're dealing with vertebrate pests. Um, if you have questions, my contact information is listed there uh, in terms of an email. Uh, good luck in your farming operation and um, good luck in terms of managing wildlife nuisance problems on your farm.